Welcome, everybody. So delighted to see everyone here on this beautiful day. Um, I'm Suzanne Goldberg, Executive Vice President for University Life here at Columbia, and I am so glad to welcome you, including those who are watching on the live stream today, uh, to Awakening Our Democracy, Borders, Bands, and Belonging, a campus conversation about immigration, what's happening now, and what lies ahead. We have a fantastic panel whom I'll introduce in a moment. First, I want to say a word about the Office of University Life and about the Awakening Our Democracy series. So the Office of University Life is, among many things, a hub for university-wide student life, information, resources, and opportunities for conversation like the one we're having today. We bring together students, faculty, and staff from across all of the schools at Columbia for exactly these kinds of conversations to talk about the pressing issues of our time at a university level within our community. For students who are in the room and also on the live stream, I want to also invite you to join campus conversations. Those are student-hosted discussions about identity and belonging, and they are led by students. Uh, they're happening now. They'll be happening throughout the year. You have some information on your seats. And there's much more information about this and everything else on University Life's website, uh, universitylife.columbia.edu, and also on all of our social media and on the University Life app. So please download that app and check these things out if you haven't already. So we're here today as part of Columbia's flagship Awakening Our Democracy series. This series is designed to enable conversation from people with very different types of expertise to share with you, and then we bring in the audience, to focus on disparities and justice issues that are pressing in our time. And really, there are uh, few issues that are more pressing for us uh, today than immigration. While borders and bans have always been central to immigration and belonging both in and beyond the United States, uh, everybody here knows that they have become powerfully into the spotlight in recent times. Uh, discussions of literal walls as the, uh, the reinforcement and fortification and, and creation in parts of a wall between the United, literal wall between the United States and Mexico, but also laws made of wa walls made of law and policy. Uh, everybody is surely aware of the travel ban, which was uh, uh, to, uh, that focused mainly on Muslim majority countries that was upheld by the Supreme Court just a couple of months ago. The increasing restrictions on undocumented immigrants and now on green card and other visa holders, family separations, barriers to asylum seekers, and so much more that shapes the most fundamental ways we think about what it means to belong in the United States. Of course, these issues are not limited to our own borders here. Thanks to many of you for sharing questions when you registered for today's event. I'll just share a quick sample with you. Um, and this is really just a small number of the questions we've received. Uh, how can there be or how can institutions create fair and equitable global migration processes for all people, not only the wealthy or those who happen to be born in wealthy countries? What role does the United States play in migration from Syria and other war-torn countries in the Middle East? What lies ahead for people seeking gender-based asylum due to domestic and or sexual violence? What about climate change? How does that shape how we think about these issues? I should add that we could all spend the day together talking about these issues and still be talking. So please think of Awakening Our Democracy Conversations as an opening, as a start to a conversation that we hope you will take out of this room and continue to have with your friends, with your classmates, in and outside of classes. It's my pleasure now to introduce our stellar panel. And I'll start, uh, they, they will, Really, it's, I'm so excited to hear what they have to say. I'll start at the, the far end with May Nye. May Nye is a is highly esteemed professor of history and Asian American studies here at Columbia and a wonderful colleague of mine. Uh, she is also a Columbia alum. Professor Nye is a, an award-winning author, a prolific writer on immigration history and policy, both in academic settings and also in uh, the media. Before becoming a historian, Professor Nye was a labor, un or labor union organizer and educator in New York City. Next to Professor Nye is Paul Rosenzweig, a senior fellow with the R Street Institute, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization. 
Paul is also a lecturer, I guess I should call you professor also, a lecturer at the George Washington Law School and has many other roles as well. In the George W. Bush administration, Paul was the deputy, excuse me, the deputy assistant secretary for policy in the Department of Homeland Security. Next to Paul is Sonia Lin. Sonia is general counsel and deputy commissioner in New York City, uh, Mayor de Blasio's Office of Immigrant Affairs. She is an employment and civil rights attorney, has taught stu law students and litigated immigration cases at Cardozo Law School, and began her career in the Legal Aid Society's immigrants, uh, Immigration Law Unit. Uh, next to Sonia is Sarah Stillman, the director of the Global Migration Institute at, here at Columbia Journalism School. Sarah is also a staff writer for The New Yorker and has written many pieces on, on immigration among in, many other issues. She was named a MacArthur Fellow in 2016 and has received numerous awards for her human rights and international reporting. And I'm delighted now to introduce our moderator for today's discuss discussion, Ahmed Shihab al -Din. He is an Emmy-nominated journalist currently producing a new series for AJ Plus or Al Jazeera Plus and has been a correspondent or commentator for just about any media outlet you can think of. He has been recognized widely for his work as an inv innovator in journalism. I encourage you to take a look at some of his many videos on the web about journalism and the, and the field. He's also a graduate of Columbia's Journalism School. So here's our format. Ahmed will lead the conversation among our panelists uh, for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open up to you and we will have an opportunity for students in the audience to raise questions for the panel. We'll take them in groups of three so that we can maximize uh, audience participation. And let me turn it over now to you, Ahmed. Thank you all again for being here, and please join me in welcoming our panel. Uh, can you hear me? Does this work? Fantastic. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm really honored to be here um, for many reasons. I think this is a timely conversation. Frankly, a tough conversation, I think, to have in newsrooms and dinner tables and everywhere. So I just want to quickly start. I want to hear from our panelists, of course, but I want to start with the audience because I read a statistic that kind of stood out to me, and I think it'll help frame the debate. So very quickly, um, how many of you would, a show of hands, would say that immigration is the biggest problem facing America right now, if you had to choose? Show of hands. Wow. Okay, well, um, so the reason, I, I don't know if you're as surprised as me, but um, the reason I ask this is because there was a, a Gallup study done in July, I guess this was back when it was kind of a very heated debate, and it was the second time ever since they started asking that question, what is the most pressing issue facing America, that immigration uh, was the number one issue. Second only to the government, which for the last year and a half has been <laughs> the <laughs> number one issue every single month. Um, but that stood out to me because, I guess, according to Gallup, it is the top or most pressing issue facing America. And you know, sometimes they make it political, they divide it, divide it between Republicans and Democrats. Well, for Republicans, it's the top issue. Apparently, for both parties, it's the top issue. So with that in mind, uh, the disparity between this audience and I guess the Gallup survey, none of you were called, I guess, during that survey. But I would love to just quickly go uh, down the line and ask uh, you may, to put some context uh, on that, what do you think is the most pressing issue within immigration or immigration issues as a problem, if you will? Well, before I get to that, sure. can I back up to yes, your please. poll? Yeah. Because it depends on how they ask the question and what people thought they were answering. Right. Because there could be people on either side of the so-called immigration divide who would say it was a pressing problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So exactly. it doesn't mean people thought that immigrants are a problem, per right. se. Right. 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 Which is precisely why our panelists are here to contextualize <laughs> everything I say that's somewhat inaccurate. So what do I think is the most pressing problem within immigration? Yeah, what would you identify as kind of out well, of the gamut? I mean, I think this administration has declared an all-out war on immigrants, legal and undocumented, um, and on refugees. Uh, so I think that's the biggest problem, and it takes different forms. It takes the form of the travel ban. Mm -hmm. It takes the form of ICE raids yep. throughout the United States, you know, there were a lot of um, not entirely, well, they're not Ill unlawful moves, but there are a lot of administrative moves that were made, for example, to eliminate the idea that there should be any priorities in selecting people for removal. 
So under the Obama administration, the priorities were people with criminal records or felony records. Mm -hmm. Now, we can, we can discuss whether or not that's right or not. But once you say there are no priorities, then every single person is an equal priority. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and I don't, I don't think the administration believes that they can remove 11 million people who are here without authorization. But what they've succeeded in doing is creating an atmosphere of fear and terror among that 11 million, because you never know if you're going to get picked up, you know, walking down the street in Ohio or something like that. And and I appreciate you. I'm going to try to move along quickly so okay. that we can have really a, as engaging a debate as possible. But I was going to ask you what the motivation might be behind that, and then you just said perhaps a chilling effect. Paul, I saw you were nodding. Do you think? Do you agree with May? Would you say? Uh, I. I, I would take it in a little bit of a different way. I, I've spent a lot of time working on the policy of immigration. And for me, for the last 20 years, the most intractable problem, the di biggest one, mm -hmm. is how to deal with 11 million people who are here uh, outside the bounds of, of, of the lawful process. Uh, they Clearly, we can't you know, put 11 million in jail. We can't deport 11 million. Right. But it's a, it's a population that is irregular in, in, the, in the perspective of law. And for a lot of people who, uh, uh, who are uh, American citizens, they look at that and see that as a, a cadre of people who are illegal, unlawful. Right. And uh, finding a way to figure out how to regularize people who have come to the country unlawfully uh, without uh, you know, blowing up the whole political process was, at least in my experience, the single most difficult question to answer. I, I don't actually have an answer. So specifically, what to do with those who are already here, more right. so than how to prevent, if you will, the problem from being exacerbated by many people coming in illegally. That, that I think, would be, would be for me, the, the single most difficult and Yeah, yeah, problem. makes sense. Um, anything to add, Sonia? I think I, it's interesting that, Paul, you raise um, the issue of, um, you know, our undocumented residents uh, mm -hmm. here in the United States, because I think, you know, in thinking about this question, what is the most urgent issue um, in immigration today, I actually think because we have an administration that is um, really animated by a toxic hostility against immigrants, against those who seek to come to this country mm -hmm. um, um, from another country that is perhaps disfavored um, by this administration, um, I think that addressing um, you know, a, a policy issue, a human rights issue, an immigrant integration issue like um, the um, kind of well-being and of, of the undocumented population, the future of the undocumented population mm -hmm. um, here becomes all the more difficult. Um, we have an, an administration, um, a president who um, ended a successful popular program for dreamers um, um, as one action that he's taken. Um, and, and so then how do we, how do we address um, you know, the other 11 million um, undocumented residents here when a program that supports uh, um, uh, young people's ability to integrate, to contribute fully um, to their communities, um, to help stabilize um, you know, where they are. Now it's been thrown um, and, into turmoil. And forgive me for jumping in, but and feel free to, to, to you know, get into a conversation amongst yourselves. I guess that would be more interesting than me always jumping in. But as you were saying that, I just thought of the word that Paul had used, regularize. And you just mentioned that in terms of you know, what do we do with the people who are in, in kind of limbo now. And I, I guess when you mentioned the dreamers, that's what came to mind. It almost seemed like they were going to be regularized, and then, for better or worse, you know, now, as you said, that policy ended. Uh, any, what would yeah, you add? Yeah, and there's a lot of other policies where people have tried to regularize their status, or things like temporary protected status that was afforded to certain populations that's now being stripped away from them. So I think it's, I love what the other panelists said about we have to look at this as a dual front. There's right. attacks on. Uh, unauthorized immigration um, and people who have been here in this country for a long time who are undocumented and then attacks on people who are also here legally like the public charge which I'm sure we're gonna hear about from others on the panel mm -hmm. uh, but I thought I might just put a, a few faces and stories to this too because I'm a journalist and I teach a class here or was teaching a class on gender migration at the journalism school right when Trump came into office and so one of the very first assignments we did is we created something called the Trump Tracker. Mm -hmm. And every week we were coming to class and everyone in the class was assigned a different state and they had to look for uh, cases of immigration enforcement uh, in their assigned area along a number of different themes. We looked at things like 
uh, gender-based violence uh, survivors who were afraid of reporting uh, mm -hmm. violence um, because they were undocumented, a whole range of different themes. And we had wondered, was clearly there was a big rhetorical difference in how President Obama and President Trump were discussing immigration, but we were wondering, was that really playing out on the ground? Mm -hmm. And almost instantaneously, what emerged uh, as a major pattern in this Trump tracker was that a lot of people who had maybe come onto the radar under Obama, but who had been allowed to stay here, who were undocumented, who'd maybe been pulled over for a minor traffic violation, were suddenly being really swiftly deported. Mm -hmm. So just one small example is that we um, ended up following the story of a mother of three US citizen children, actually one DACA recipient as well, a mixed status family in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. They've been living in New Hampshire for about 17 years, um, and this mother was on her way to a job where she worked cleaning a hotel. She was pulled over for a minor traffic violation, mm -hmm. um, and very swiftly thereafter, she was turned over to um, immigration enforcement and deported to Honduras, where she's since been assaulted and is living separated from her family. Um, and that, that case, I mentioned that case in part because it reflects the changes administration-wise. The father had faced a similar thing under Obama and had been allowed to stay. Right, and May, go ahead. Well, I just want to um, uh, add to what Paul raised. Um, if the problem of, uh, of the question of solving the problem of status, of legalizing people who, who are without lawful status, mm -hmm. is a bit, uh, that is a big problem, but it's a problem that's political. It can be done. It's been done in the past. I'm a historian. I have studied a dozen legalization programs that the United States has run ever since we had, we created restrictions, right? Because if there's no restrictions, everybody's legal, right? And when you have an open door, everybody's legal. So once we closed the door, once we established a restrictive policy that had numerical ceilings on how many people could come in, then you inevitably have a problem or a creation of unauthorized migration. But over the 20, course of the 20th century, our government has found a way, one way or another, to legalize people's status and because they realize that if people are here, notwithstanding they may have come without papers, once they are here and they establish roots, they have families, they're part of communities, they're employed, they own property, they cannot live in the shadows forever. May, and may the problem in the last 10 years has mm -hmm. been singularly a political problem mm -hmm. of the conservative wing of the Republican Party not wanting to legalize anybody, and we've gone down from there. And May, I, forgive me, I was going to interject and just ask, when you say political, because it's often described that way in the media, like what does it actually mean? I mean, you started saying the Republican Party doesn't want to legalize anyone. Well, I'd love to okay, hear Okay, let's Paul take thinks. an example. Let's take an example of the last, um, made one of the last major bills for comprehensive immigration reform. Mm -hmm. Now, I won't get into what that means, because it's complicated, but <laughs> they, but it has, they all have some program to regularize the status of people who have no status, mm -hmm. right? So they say, okay, so um, they will uh, adjust the status of people, normalize or regularize the status of people who have been here for X number of years. So that automatically cuts off some people who have not been here that long. Although to be tr honest, most people who live in the United States, especially away from the border, have been here five to 10 years. So they've mm -hmm. been here for a considerable period of time. Mm -hmm. Then they put, start putting, piling on restrictions. You have to pay a fine. Mm -hmm. That could be quite steep. Then once you, get, uh, once, you, once you get regularized, you have a wait before you can become a, get a green card. So you're in this limbo status for X years. Then you, get, you can petition for a green card. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you can apply to be a citizenship. So what we talk about as being a path to citizenship mm -hmm. The bill that actually was marked up was 15 years. And I believe that was done so that they could say they would legalize people, but punish them tremendously and forestall at least one generation from voting, because it's all about the electoral map. So this is what I mean by political. So when, when um, people are asked in polls, you know, do you think right. people should be legalized? A majority of Americans think so. And if you, tweak the question and say, well, should they have a waiting period? Should they pay a fine? You know, the more qualifications you put on it, it goes up to 95%. Right. So. And, and to your point, I mean, I appreciate you clarifying it, but Paul, you know, we hear that it's been political, especially under Trump. We've, it feels as though Trump is making almost everything political, at least this administration in terms of when it enacts policies. But how has it changed in your experience in the past? Yeah. Well, I, I feel like it, my, my 
role on this panel is clearly to do some defending of immigration uh, <laughs> rules. Um, and I will do so without in the least bit defending President Trump. Yeah, yeah, Trump, I understand. Right? Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I, I think it paints with too broad a brush right. to say that it's, uh, it's all the Republican Party. President Bush came to office with the intent right. of pushing for comprehensive That's immigration true. reform. He was uh, short-circuited substantially by the 9-11 attacks, mm -hmm. which threw all of America's right. uh, relationship to people outside the borders you know, for a loop for, for a good three years. Uh, I spent most of 2006 and 2007 working on that very uh, comprehensive immigration reform bill that, um, that you talked about, and, um, and it was a series of compromises. I would say that I think that the piece that's sort of missing from your story, mm -hmm. um, and this is to not to defend my own perspective, but to put myself in the perspective of those who ultimately uh, uh, prevented comprehensive immigration reform from happening, right. is that they felt very much like the earlier legalization uh, uh, efforts were a shell game. We got 1986 uh, immigration reform that came with a very uh, extensive uh, legalization program and amnesty, but it also came with a promise of uh, enhanced border enforcement that was going to make sure that this problem right. uh, didn't happen again. And you know, fast forward 20 years to 2006, mm -hmm. and from that perspective, the problem had you know half the, the, the we delivered. The Republicans said thought. We've delivered on our half, we regularized, we legalized a big bolus of people. We, we choked that down, but we didn't get the border enforcement. And right. so they, they were much leerier, especially the conservative wing of the party. And, I, and, I, and you know what I find fascinating is it's almost impossible to discuss immigration without falling into traps about how politically polarized I think our, our, our kind of political landscape is. And what I mean by that is, you know, there were all these reports towards the end of the Obama administration in terms of discussing what's changed in immigration policy about how, you know, deportations were up uh, under the Obama administration. And you're saying Republicans felt as though they didn't get the enforcement on the border, even though, you know. Well, they did get the enforcement on the border. Okay. We spent almost two. Two hundred billion dollars on border enforcement since 1980. So, so it we did have, change. We have spent. We have beefed up the border, but the relationship of that to unauthorized entry yeah. is not one and one, right? And I mean, can I just express yeah, please. some doubt? I please. mean, the highest ever rate of illegal migration into the United States was in 1999, right? 1 1.8 million that year. Mm -hmm. uh, we did get improvements post 9/11. Okay, but you know, just uh, but. You know, to kind of characterize it from 80 to 99 is, uh, and, and part of it was, you know, enhanced enforcement post-99 in an effort to demonstrate that it was possible, that maybe this deal would work. Would work. Yeah, we, we can deliver this time. <laughs> so, so, so last week, and feel free to jump in without me calling anybody, but, but I do want to put this in there in the debate, because last week I was watching MSNBC, which was probably mistake number one, not to trash MSNBC, but it seems like it's hard to watch cable these days in general. Uh, President Trump said in one of his speeches, you know, which even MSNBC airs, forgive me, I'm just speaking honestly, airs for 12 minutes, and then, you know, he invariably says something that is tweetable or not. But he did say, and I'm curious your thoughts, we have the worst immigration laws in the history of mankind, and then he added, or womankind. Um, <laughs> which, you know, which is great in that context. But I'm curious, do you agree? Do you agree with that statement? And what, how can we contextualize that? Does America, I mean, the president of America is saying we have the worst immigration laws of, of women and men. Kind. What does that mean well, to you? Is that, that well, something? I don't know what he means. Historian on our I panel. To, I hate to be the guy who asks the panels to what does Trump mean, but, but what I'm getting at is, are America's immigration policies today, let me rephrase, I guess, uh, the question, the worst on the planet compared to other countries, and have they gotten worse uh, in, your, in your capacity? What's your scale? Last, since you were working in the Bush administration. Well, I mean, but what's your scale? Uh, America's immigration policies differ substantially from other nations. Some nations give preferences uh, to immigration skills higher than we do. Yeah. Uh, we spend a lot of our effort on family reunification, a lot of the 
uh, yeah, a lot of the answers. So M maybe my scale what's is your, what's your scale? Maybe the scale is like you know North America, Canada compared to the U.S. Or no, but the reason I say this is because a lot of people, when they're critical of the U.S. administration's policy, they point to Europe, where there's perhaps more pressure in terms of people arriving. Uh, I, refugees I think what he, arriving. what he, I, I don't know what he means. <laughs> what he says, I can't. But I think what he means to do is to invoke an image of hordes of brown people and Muslims overrunning the country. That's what he means, that we, and we can't stop it. I think that's what he means to... So it's an emotional appeal. I or think most of what he does is an emotional appeal. Okay, in my fair enough. Right. But think, let me get, can I just... Yeah, please. I don't, I don't want to... No, 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 go ahead. Please, please. I just want to speak to this issue of um, border uh, control and unauthorized migration. You know, in what really, I mean, the border controls, you know, the erection of walls, mm -hmm. drones, you know, all these um, uh, increase of the, the border patrol force, et cetera, et cetera. They did have some effect in deterring unlawful entry. Mm -hmm. Not, they didn't stop it completely, but it did have some effect. But what really stopped people from coming over the southern border was the recession in 2008. Mm -hmm. The recession reversed the flow of migration. And now we have a net zero mm -hmm. migration from Mexico, yep. net zero. So it's not a crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who are showing up at the border today are asylum seekers and refugees from Central America. And I think that, you know, that's a, a really serious problem. Mm -hmm. It has to do with violence in, in the region. Yeah. Violence that the United States yeah. is not. Well, can I ask? Um, yes. You know, but, but if I may, just, to do. if I just may bring in these two yeah. voices, we yeah. can come back. But I appreciate you bringing that up because th I think that points to one of my questions about misconceptions. But Having I mean, gone to the border recently myself mm -hmm. um, with a group of grandmothers, hundreds of grandmothers wow. called Grannies Respond, who were fed up watching what had happened. Um, and so they went from New York City to Mexico. The point is to see for themselves, to kind of get beyond what you know the media narratives uh, are. So I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Is that a misconception? What would you highlight as perhaps the, the biggest misconceptions? That people are all criminals, for example, which the president repeatedly says. You know, I mean, that's, that's politics, but. I mean, there's so many myths and misconceptions right, when it comes right. to immigration. I think we could, you know, spend several hours yeah, talking about them. The I most think, problematic. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's so interesting about this conversation and where we started, right, is immigration a problem. I yeah. think, you know, coming from my perspective, New York City is the ultimate city of immigrants. Right. Three million New Yorkers are born outside of the United States. It's mm -hmm. about 40% of the New York City population. Mm -hmm. um, you know, immigrants come from all corners of the world, um, kind of work in every industry, all age levels. There are over 200 languages spoken in New York City. New York City is also uh, the safest big city in America. We're mm -hmm. thriving. Um, we embrace our immigrant neighbors and mm -hmm. colleagues and classmates. Um, you know, we see immigration as a great thing for our city. It is what has helped us become the strong and vibrant and attractive and diverse city that we are. It's not a problem, right? The problem, I think, is very clearly at the federal level. Um, and, you know, that is um, the job of the federal government government or sort of the failure of the right. federal government. Um, but from the local level, from kind of the neighborhood perspective, from the city perspective, um, you know, we are great, you know, and we are, you know, we are, you know, mm -hmm. living uh, side by side uh, with our immigrant neighbors. Sarah, anything? Yeah, I want to chime in also a little bit on the point you were making about differentiating asylum seekers from other economic migrants who for, you know, the last 40 years were at one of the lowest points of that kind of economic migration. And what we are seeing is the surge of people who have fled gang violence and other forms of violence in Central America. And one of the astounding contradiction I, contradictions I would argue in this administration is that people who are actually presenting themselves directly at ports of entry and asking by, in accordance with both domestic and international law, mm -hmm. for protection, for safe harbor, mm -hmm. are being either told directly, I'm sorry, Trump's president now, and we're gonna turn you back. I mean, I've right. talked to quite a number of women who presented themselves to Border Patrol or mm -hmm. presented themselves at ports of entry and were turned back and who were kidnapped or yeah. sexually assaulted thereafter. And so I think that's a really important misconception as well, that people are somehow trying to like sneak across in massive droves as yeah. opposed to actually simply come here to express their legal right to seek safety. And one thing, I, and I would love to come to you, Paul, but one thing I want to just highlight is this notion of cruelty, because I've been watching the immigration debate for a decade, given my relative young age, but I've been watching it, you know, instructively trying to learn, and I have to say, it's the first time I've seen it be as heated. Um, the criticisms being about, if you will, humanity, a lack thereof, uh, a cruelty, an intention to hurt, and as we heard from May earlier, 
to in, instill fear and, and kind of traumatize people who are already vulnerable. I don't know if that's like a, if that's an indication of our politicized times or if in fact the policies themselves are being motivated by that. And I, I wonder what you were going to add, uh, Paul, if you were going to well, respond. I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't going in that direction. So right. if you want to take us that way, we can. Well, I, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because of what you mentioned and the misinformation and that, how that can then come back and kind of change the, the public's consciousness about what is actually happening versus a perception of what is happening. So I'm, it, I, I've we'll been, come back to you, Paul. I've been thinking a lot about this uh, in terms of um, refugees and asylum seekers. And I think that, you know, w one thing that really struck me was when uh, Attorney General Sessions yeah. defended the policy of separating children from their parents. Mm -hmm. He said, these people are taking advantage of a loophole mm -hmm. in the law. And I was really offended by that because, as Sarah said, what they're doing is completely legal under U.S. and international law. Um, they have the right to come to the border and ask for asylum. Mm -hmm. And that's not a loophole. To say it's a loophole is to say, well, maybe technically, maybe it's okay, but really it's not okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really serious issue. And I think for a lot of Americans right now, we have to ask ourselves, you know, do we have any room in our national politics and culture for compassion and humanitarian work? Because I think m m much of this country doesn't think so anymore. And they, they think it's all about, you know, make America great. Or even people who are not Trump supporters think that, you know, my job, my community, not yeah. in my backyard. And I think we've come very far away from any kind of collective or social consciousness. And we only think about our immediate selves. Right. And I think that's a very sad place that we've come to. Well, I, I, I I guess what I was trying to get to, and it's, it's interesting because, Paul, earlier you were saying and asking what was the scale, like what scale was I referring to, and I think this is exactly where I see uh, the shift happening. It used to be, and whether it matters or not we can discuss later, it used to be that America, you know, the Statue of Liberty, I'm kind of going to gel over a lot of things that I think we all know, but the, the idea of what America stood for um, seems to be distorted and disrupted by this administration in a way that I think in recent modern history it hasn't been. And the scale is America's own reputation to a lot of these people, not just who are coming, to the European allies, if you will. Um, you look at Canada, a lot of my friends who are in the Middle East in war-torn countries who, are, who, who need to leave try to eventually get to Canada. The, the idea of the US right now is not even an option. So I'm, I'm curious. Um, what did you make of what, what May said, and what do you think is the most pressing issue in terms of misconception? That's a good question. Because uh, uh, they all I, seem I mean, to I, agree. I, I have, I have uh, two responses. Yes. Um, uh, the first is that I, I think that what May is saying is right, that there's a coarsening of America's response to uh, the diversification of its society, True. Uh, that it used to be more welcoming. Uh, what I think we in this room mm -hmm. don't understand mm -hmm. is that that coarsening is very much geographically localized. Uh, my family came to New York in the, in the 1890s and 1910s from mm -hmm. Eastern Europe. I don't know when your families came, but New York <coughs> has always been diverse. And actually, if we measure the scale of diversification change, uh, New York is essentially no more or less diverse now than it was 50 years ago. We, the composition has changed, but the, right. very, the real change, if you put a heat map on it, the extent of diversification of the population is broadly localized Midwest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, upper Midwest and the South. And I think that what we here don't understand, because I actually associate myself with, with your you know, love of New York mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and its diversity, is that for a lot of people, it's disruptive. So, you know, it is, you know, it, it's, it's easy to say that they're kind of crueler, and, and some well, of them but are, so, but, 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 I think, but I think for a it, lot it, of them, it's really <laughs> just yes, that their whole social structure. Sure. I mean, the, the, most, the most, from 2000 to 2015, 
the single county that became more diverse by scale on a per capita basis yeah. was Templemau County, Wisconsin, okay. which went from pure white to yeah. not. Which is, which is a dramatic shift. Uh, Sonia, your response? Yeah, I think, I think um, that's definitely a good point, but I do want to kind of complexify that point a little bit by noting, you know, yes, New York City always been a city of immigrants. It's right. part of our kind of values. I think um, this is like required when you move to the city that you sign on um, to this value statement. Um, but we have learned over the last few years that we are not alone um, amongst local governments in seeing the value of immigrants to our communities. Um, and I think we've seen this tremendous momentum right. amongst mayors, county executives, local government right. leaders across the country, not just in New York or Los Angeles, but in the heartland, um, you know, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, right. in Chicago, um, in the South as well. Um, we have a very strong relationship with the mayor's office in Atlanta, um, and we've increasingly come together um, as mayors to say, hey, we appreciate well, our immigrant residents. We support them. So would you say well, that the immigration problem is a uh, is it the divide is urban rural? No, I don't think so. Uh, Sarah? I think it's really important to underscore too that a lot of that concern and that anxiety is actually coming from mm -hmm. rhetoric that's trying to tether immigration to criminality, for instance. I mean, if you look at right. Trump's way of talking about immigration and consistently underscoring like MS-13 is not a threat in Wisconsin. You know, MS-13 is you know, right. a reality that we need to reckon with, but I think that's been so empirically disproven that there's a correlation between immigration and crime. And I think in a lot of places you're seeing mm -hmm. the greatest anxiety about immigration where people aren't even necessarily dealing with a huge influx of immigrants in their own communities. And I think that comes from the stories we're disseminating and hearing from people in positions of power. And, and what do you think is triggering or spurring this idea of local officials coming together? I mean, we've all heard of sanctuary cities standing up to like federal rhetoric or pushes or shifts in immigration mm -hmm. policy, but it does seem like it's a new moment. I hate to always just say it's Trump's rhetoric. I mean, it seems too simple. I don't think simple. it is. I think, I mean, this momentum was starting even before Trump came into office. Right. And I think from our perspective, we started working with our fellow mayor's offices across the country during the Obama administration, actually when we thought there was going to be an expansion of the DACA program right. um, to provide executive action sort of relief to um, um, the parents of U.S. citizens um, and sort of an expanded dreamer population. And yeah. we, we kind of found fellowship with our sister cities right away to say this is something that's good for us. Yeah. We want to support it. We want to be ready. when the administration rolls it out to be able to connect our residents to this kind of relief. Um, and it was big cities and small cities. It wasn't just the huge metropolitan right. areas. I mean, I think it really comes from this very pragmatic place. We're responsible for the health and safety and welfare the of community. our residents. Yeah. And therefore, right. it's good when our residents want to come to us and report crimes to the police and go to the hospital and you know live their daily lives. We don't want to alienate people. And, and in about 10 minutes, we're going to open it up to the audience. So May, go ahead if you want to Well, I was just going to, um, just to add to your last point, I think one of the reasons, um, well, I think what you see happening across the country in rural and urban areas in traditionally high immigrant density areas and newer areas um, is that local elected officials and law enforcement have very different interests when it comes to immigration and immigration control. Um, a lot of local law enforcement are very re reluctant to be the arm of the federal government because then, mm -hmm. as you said, immigrants will be afraid to report crimes to them. Immigrants will be afraid to use um, local services and then you have public health issues. So people at the local level have a different set of concerns. And one of the misunderstandings, I think, that has been uh, put out there by this administration is that the so-called sanctuary cities or jurisdictions are breaking the law. Yeah. They're not breaking the law. Our Constitution says that states do not have to, are not responsible for enforcing federal laws. So by, not, by declining to cooperate with ICE, local jurisdictions are not breaking the law. They are actually standing on the law. Right, and, and, and if I can just uh, put out a statistic for a conversation we were having earlier about the cruelty aspect of this administration, specifically the policy, um, criticisms that are made about the zero tolerance policy. You know, of course, months later of 2,654 uh, separated children, there are still 211 
that are still under the Trump administration's custody without their parents. Six of them are under five years old. And the parents of 165 of those children have, in fact, already been deported. And, and the reason I bring this up is having gone on that road trip with the grandmothers, this was something that really triggered a visceral reaction amongst people who um, have endured or their ancestors have endured family separation, whether the most extreme examples, the Holocaust, uh, and so on and so forth, that's what spurred them to actually get into the streets. I mean, these were like 94-year-old grandmothers, some of them. And so that's what I was pointing to. And, and I, I would love to ask kind of to everybody before we open it to the Q&A, the zero tolerance policy, it's been in the courts. We've seen the Trump administration fail to address what the court mandated in terms of you know, joining them. That particular issue, how important is it that that gets resolved? And how do we move in general, I know this is a broad question, towards a more, um, forget common sense and compassion, which is what the grandmothers were trying to bring to the immigration policy, but to a more constructive and, and sustainable immigration solution? Wow. If you have the answer, <laughs> Well, I guess family separation does feel like a very useful lens through which to yeah. look at a broad array of immigration right. problems we've okay. been discussing on this panel. I think that really struck people viscerally when they saw children rift from their parents directly at the border. And I think that problem has certainly not stopped. And we're finding out right now right. that a lot of families actually, parents were felt coerced into signing paperwork in order to get their kids yeah. back and agreed to be deported in order to have their child with them when that they experienced that. Now they're living in a very unsafe situation with those children in Central America. So it's not just the kids who have not yet been reunited with their families. It's a whole range of problems. But I think it's really useful because we were all struck by those particular images of family mm -hmm. separation to start thinking about how we could apply that empathy to other contexts. What's going to happen to the temporary protective status families mm -hmm. when they get separated? Mm -hmm. What's happening to DACA kids whose parents or uncles and aunts may be facing deportation right now? Right. Um, what's happening to the families who are separated by, the tra by all of the regulations and restrictions around refugees, some of whom are currently trapped in refugee camps awaiting a three-year process to resettle yeah. with UNHCR while one of their family members may be here. And, and, and I guess to, to make the questions uh, a little more simple or not so, so broad, the reason I asked it, and I appreciate you bringing that up about the, the, this particular policy of zero tolerance, is this weekend, um, I noticed, and I just wanted to bring this up before we move forward, there's this proposed new rule this, that legal immigrants, and I think this is important just to put out there, even though it's a bit specific, because oftentimes when we discuss immigration, there's legal immigrants who are here legally, and then there are those who are undocumented or here illegally, if you will. So if I understand this correctly, and this is what I'd love for either Sonia or May to address, um, legal immigrants would be forced to choose between feeding and housing themselves and their children being awarded a green card. It's, it's um, basically public benefits such as food stamps and you know, Section 8 housing vouchers, Medicaid, will be considered heavily weighted negative factors for those who are waiting for their green card applications. So this sounds very in the weeds, but I, but I do wonder you know, if this is an extension of this tactic under this current administration, which is different than others of, of really, whether you want to call it cruelty, but really instilling fear and creating it, it almost makes it, it's like a, if there's a problem that we are all agreeing is protracted, giving people less options and, and kind of instilling fear in their decision making seems to me not to be a way to solve it. I mean, May, is this something that's a big problem or is it indicative of something? Well, um, I mean, ever since 1882, our first Federal Immigration Act, we've had a provision that excludes people who are likely to be a public charge. And since that time, all the way until this year, um, public charge has been defined very clearly as somebody who is completely dependent mm -hmm. upon the government for subsistence or is long-term institutionalized. So it used to be people who were in poor houses or asylums. Then in our own time, it was people who were on, um, who were, uh, on welfare. Right. right. Cash, cash subsistence, entirely dependent on cash subsistence. Now, even up till the 1970s, undocumented immigrants had access to these, to these benefits, right? So what we now have is an expansion of what a public charge means, right. which is if you take Medicaid, if you have food stamps, a Section 8 voucher, and these, this is not full-time subsistence. This is, these are actually benefits that the government provides for what we call the working poor, people who work but who do not earn enough 
to meet the federal, or they're very close to the federal poverty level. And, and they mean to help one? people, not yep. to completely support them. Go ahead, Sonia. And I think just to add what, to what May is saying, this rule came out, or the proposal came out over the weekend. It's like over 400 pages long, yeah. so I think we're all still digesting yeah. it. But something that was really striking to me is that um, in addition to penalizing immigrants for lawfully using public benefits and resources right. that they're eligible for. Which supposedly they use, sorry to interrupt, I just want to point out, apparently they use it less than native-born Americans right, At a do. lower rate. Yeah, at a lower rate. Yeah, um, exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Exactly. Um, it also... Um, kind of changes the goalposts. It penalizes um, people who wish to obtain green cards or visas based on an evaluation that they may right. rely on public benefits right. in the future right. um, in a way where um, essentially um, you know, the administration is trying to change what legal immigration looks like to favor right. people with more resources, with higher skills, um, and kind of denying the way in which um, you know, immigrants have come to this country and um, contributed and enriched our communities for right. generations. And it does kind of change the narrative in that yeah. context as well, uh, in terms of the public's perception. Paul, I'm curious, you know, one thing that this uh, Guardian article very conveniently for me raised out of the 447 page document which I didn't read was this idea that there could be a chilling effect being the intended consequence of this administration. They were kind of analyzing what could be the motivation behind some of these new rules and proposals that for example many immigrants would rather be safe than sorry so they'd take themselves off benefit rolls even if the specific role, rule, one of the many, doesn't apply to them, and in fact, the Guardian suggests that you know this has already happened. So we're going to go to the Q and A. But I'm curious: do you think this is a do you think this is a winning strategy? And and for the administration, will it alleviate the immigration uh, problem? Well, you know, what you characterize as chilling, right? I think they would characterize as deterrence, right? Um, semantics. And, and, and yeah, it's semantics. And, and we use the phrase chilling when you think that what is being uh, deterred is a beneficial right. uh, Immigration. Product, like chilling free speech. Right. right. We like free speech, so when we, when we try and limit it, we're chilling it. Right. But if you think that it's a bad product, like criminality, right. we try and deter criminality. So I agree. Coming illegally there, would be the crime, right? Yeah, Not yeah. coming to America. Yeah. yeah. Right. Coming illegally. So I agree that, that the entire purpose, a characterization, if I would write an overarching uh, narrative for the Trump administration, which I do not buy, okay, just <laughs> want to say that one more time, um, it's, it's, you know, overall an effort to deter um, lots of different types of migration and forestall the changing demography of, yes, of, of the United yes. States. May you agree? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the intent, whether it's Separating children at the border, which clearly says to families, don't come. So or would you work. call that, I'm just curious, would you call the separating of children a deterrent or well, a chilling? That's what they call it. That's, that's what they call it. That's, that's what, what they wanted they to do. That's deterrent. what they call it. They wanted to scare what? the what? What did they call shit it? out of people. Deterrent. Yeah. Yeah. Deterrent. Okay. They wanted to scare the bejeebus out of people yeah. so that they wouldn't come. In my mind, yeah, from a semantics perspective, I mean, that's as chill as you can get, separating kids from their parents. But anyway, yeah. that's my opinion, and that's not what we're here for. So we're here for your questions. If you could just show, raise your hands. I think we have someone with microphones who will be coming around. And we'll get three questions, um, so please make sure they're questions, although you can add maybe a bit of a comment. Okay. And the, the, yeah, please. We'll uh, my name you. is Marcel Shahwaro. I'm from Syria, and I arrived like last month. Wow. And I don't know why I am not banned, and everyone I know is banned, so I'm not nostalgic. I'm not overwhelmed by New York. I'm guilty. Uh, the problem is here with the ban exactly, it's deeper than immigration and ban, is how the U.S. dealing with counter-violence extremism. So without linking the problem to deeper roots, I think we are still mobbling, and Trump make it easy to think it's happened with Trump. It didn't. I entered the U.S. when Obama administration, and in the border it was humiliating. Six hours with six people with random check, all of them right. Muhammad and Ahmed, so it's <laughs> yani, yeah. randomly yeah. not as random as it is. So to me, what I'm scared of is this tendency now to th think that everything is related to this administration right. is going to make things worse because those problems used to be there and those people weren't illegalized before the Trump administration come. Right. And still we are not moving forward. So what I'm asking is what is being done right 
to solve the problem beyond caricaturing Trump presidency, beyond the simple criticizing of Trump right. administration. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Uh, we'll get two more questions quickly. Um, go uh -huh. ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Carla Reyes Diaz. Carla, yeah. So, speaking, you know, first of all, thank you for coming and opening this narrative on campus. Speaking from my own experience, so I'm a first generation American. My mom is an immigrant. And when it comes to the policies and just the lack of communication that there is between the actual policies mm -hmm. and the people receiving them, there's so much fear, miscommunication. They don't understand what applies to them, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. How do, in, in light of the recent policy that you guys mentioned regarding mm -hmm. how this will affect already sure. existing immigrants in the US, how do you think, or what policies do you think are important to talk about brings to air that affect people not trying to come currently into the US, mm -hmm. but who are already here, right. whether legally or <coughs> Great. documented? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Last one. Uh, we'll go in the back right there to the gentleman. Um, my name, hi, my name is Eric. Um, and it, as a reaction to many of the actions uh, of the Trump presidency, recently yeah. many on the left have started to call for an abolishment of ICE. And I'm curious what you make of this call to abolish ICE, will it help at all? And if not, what policies should we offer as a reaction it's to It's a great the question, presidency? since it's often being discussed in the media. Um, let's, uh, anyone who wants to answer the, the question from the young Syrian lady? I'll Go chime in on that. Yeah. I, I think it's a really, really important point, because I think this administration has also exposed some degree of hypocrisy in many of us, myself included at times, being less willing to be critical of certain things that occurred under, say, the prior administration, things right. like the family detention policy that was revived under Obama. And right. one of the projects I've been doing here at Columbia is um, creating a tracker of people who've been deported to their deaths, so yeah. people who came here seeking asylum who were not uh, given it and who were sent back and killed. And one of the things we found is that many of the cases we've collected happened under the prior administration. It was really hard to get people to pay attention to the realities of the violence people were fleeing at that time. Mm -hmm. And I think you made a very, very important point about looking at the deeper history right. of those policies, not just in Syria, but also I would say that's a critical issue in Central America. I mean, we need to be cognizant of the way that American wars in the, 19, the American funded wars in the 1980s helped to drive a cycle that continues today of right. deportations to the region, people fleeing violence again, and then being deported back again. And right. I think, I, th I really appreciate the historical lens you asked us to, um, to bring to that. So it's certainly not just Trump. I think it is important in the refugee context to acknowledge we are at a, facing a tremendous cut in the number of refugees from, uh, I think it was, what, 110,000 that Obama was aspiring to bring in his last year to 30,000. Right. So that is um, a distinction that merits noting and Anyone else singular to Trump. Anyone else want to add to that, Paul? Well, I, I, I would address the abolish ICE question. Sure. Um, you know, as a country, we're not going to get rid of immigration, in, of the enforcement of immigration laws, unless we get rid of the laws themselves. So there will always be that function. The abolish ICE idea has a certain resonance and salience um, uh, with people who, who are offended by President Trump's um, uh, policies. I have to tell you that from my perspective, uh, it's probably the best thing that could happen to President Trump. Uh, for that mm -hmm. to be the, the mantra and the motto because it sounds so extreme. It sounds like abolishing immigration enforcement generally, right. not just the institution. But and so he loves to paint people that way. And it, it, it's great here in New yeah. York, right? But it doesn't, I don't think it sells very well in, in uh, Iowa. And, and, and then if maybe we can, uh, it was it founded in 2003, correct? Ice? Well, well, ICE was an amalgamation right. of earlier immigration yeah. enforcement activities maybe. that had existed since Long the before. 1980s. So maybe it's the terminology does matter because when you do say abolish ICE, I think maybe a lot of people who want to abolish ICE really just want to kind of deconstruct it, this thing that was created in 2003 and reform it and maybe call it whatever you will, but I don't know. I mean, I that's mean, I, I think speaking, semantics. Um, you know, from our perspective where the mayor has called um, to abolish ICE. Right. Um, the idea exactly is that this <laughs> system is broken, the agency is broken, um, you know, when we're seeing things like family separation, when we're seeing here in yeah. New York, um, immigrants being arrested at the courthouses, even though it's well known that it will you know, deter others from going to court, victims, witnesses from participating, the indiscriminate enforcement that we've been talking about today. Um, you know, this agency is not working. It should be replaced right. uh, by an agency that is driven by a more prioritization by 
genuine um, kind of consideration of security yeah. um, and safety issues and immigrant inclusion. And, and perhaps we can hear, yeah, May, you want to maybe yeah, take I'll the question? I'll take a stab at um, that question. I think that's a great question because people feel very insecure right now, um, confused. They don't know where to go for information. Um, there are a lot of um, grassroots organizations, um, labor unions. The flash flood warning, fine. it's all fine, I think. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I shouldn't yeah. say we that. We may be here all afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, there are a lot of uh, church groups that are organizing and, and they offer things that are called generally know your rights trainings. And you could go to Judson Memorial Church any Tuesday evening and get Know Your Rights training. Mm -hmm. um, we've had them on this campus before. Um, labor unions conduct them for their members. And these are really important. You need to know that if you are stopped on the street, you are not required to show papers to a police officer, right? If ICE agents get on a Greyhound bus and ask to see everybody's papers, nobody has to show those things. But it's scary when, when they come knocking or when they get on that bus. So I think these trainings are important. Um, and I think at the grassroots, you know, I mean, I think this is where, you know, I think our hope right now lies in two places. One is at the grassroots and the other is in the federal courts, yeah. right? We'll see how long that lasts. But in the, at the local level, there are many organizations that are trying to help people know how to defend their rights, know what their rights are, and they also strategize about what to do if ICE comes into a community, what to do when ICE goes into a workplace. I know one local union that works with the um, employers and tells the employers, you do not have to let them in if they don't have right. a warrant for somebody. And the employers don't want ICE to disrupt their, their workplaces, so they find a common ground to defend people in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Some of these unions train their workers that if, if, if ICE gets past, the front door, they train them with things like, okay, your job is to, t is to video on your phone everything they do. Your job is to take down their badge numbers. Your job is to get out the book that has the numbers of all the social service agencies in the area. So people are trying to be prepared for these eventualities. And I think it's, you know, maybe we should do more on this campus this year. You know, we did a lot when, um, when the first executive orders came down and there was widespread fear and the university helped gives legal advice to, to students who wanted to know what their options were. And I think the university is a great resource for that. Sonia, go ahead very quickly, and then I want to get six more questions in before we wrap. Six or the, six? <laughs> the only thing I want to add, because I think it's absolutely true that community engagement and empowerment of communities is super critical right now. Um, and you know, in local government, we really uh, work in partnership with community groups and the stakeholders in the community. And we look to you to guide us and demand more of us um, in terms of informing, educating, um, and helping to support the community, especially at this time um, when there is tremendous fear and confusion, and some of it seems to be deliberately stoked by this administration. And, and for what it's worth, it seems as though civil society, which is helping in Europe with their own refugee and immigration issues, is coming under a lot of kind of criminalization from some governments. So it doesn't seem like this is a unique uh, trajectory that we're headed in here in America. I just wanted to mention that to globalize it. Let's see, maybe just three more questions, but there were a lot of hands. All right, let's Jesus. go to this gentleman in the front. All right, so I'm actually going to stand, if that's okay. because, And if you can just really be very brief and ask a question, I'd appreciate it. Um, second generation, uh, you know, U.S. citizen. Uh, my name is Zach Connor. Uh, quick question in regards to taking it from um, you know family reju uh, rejoination um, perspective, take it more to an economics perspective. My grandparents always talked about you know the uh, hardships. Would there ever be like a indentured servitude program to like get like uh, immigrants across the border that's sustainable? That would be you know plausible. Great question. We'll, we'll wait two more quickly. We'll get uh, this gentleman. My name is Ghanem Hablin, I'm from the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and my question is that if we look at what lies ahead, given the fact of population growth, isn't it inevitable that borders are, are going to get tighter in a way? Okay, so that's the long view, I like that, that's great, mm -hmm. or maybe not that long. Uh, third question? 
Go ahead. Hi, my name is Lisette Voitko. I'm an MS student here at the J School, and I'm focused on immigration and politics. And in terms of the Abolish ICE movement, I'm curious to get everyone's take on uh, whether it really helps or harms the immigrant community. Um, for example, ICE uses jails in Hudson and Bergen counties to house detainees. Those contracts with the state of New Jersey are currently up for termination, but once those contracts are terminated, Detainees then have to be housed further away. They can't access services. They can't see their families. So I'm curious what your opinions are on that. OK, maybe we start right there. Who wants to take that question? I'll take this one. May. Um, the 13th Amendment forbids slavery or any kind of form of servitude. So it would be unconstitutional. However, we have a history uh, in this country in the 20th century of having what we call guest worker programs, where people are admitted lawfully mm -hmm. um, to work uh, often tied to a specific employer um, for a specific amount of time and then they have to go back. And those programs are a disaster because they are terribly exploited. The workers have virtually no rights. If they protest, they are sent home. Um, and I think we have to ask if we want a country that has really a, a caste system where we have some people who get to come and be citizens and others who do scut work, you know, um, agricultural work or work in uh, hotel resorts or mm -hmm. work cutting trees for paper. If we want to have a, a whole, you know, hundreds of thousands if not millions of people who just work and we don't care about their families, we don't care about them being part of our communities, mm -hmm. I think that's something that we've already done to a certain degree and I don't think we should do it anymore. And if I just say this, is where, this is where it's going right now because if you cut legal immigration and if you're targeting people from uh, low-income backgrounds, people from the global south, what are you going to do? Who's going to wash the dishes in the hotels? Right. Right. So that so this is where we're going. We're going to a kind of indentured servitude, although it wouldn't be exactly that. But we'd go to temporary guest worker programs. So you would have all the brown people here as labor, but not as human beings. And I think that's a terrible place to go. Uh, Maybe you can answer the inevitability of, I guess, yeah, porous no, borders I, I, and I, I, population I, I, growth. I love that question because I think it's exactly right. Um, uh, both growth in population and uh, limitations on resources, diminishing resources, uh, mean competition, uh, essentially. And uh, we are seeing right now, because of uh, uh, everything from, from uh, climate change and famine to war, the largest by volume and the largest as a percentage uh, global movement flows that we've ever seen mm -hmm. in, in human history. And those are people who are being driven by everything from escaping war to escaping famine to escaping rising t uh, seas. And the people who are on the receiving end, uh, <laughs> that's basically what, what is the ultimate motivation for the hardening of borders. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I got my food. I don't want to share it with you. And, uh, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, in the near term, on, uh, and so, uh, and maybe in the long term, though I'm not a Malthusian, uh, and so I, I expect more and more pressure, and therefore greater. So you see it in Europe as a as a perfect example. Europe had had a marvelously uh, welcoming kind of uh, attitude for for a number of years, and all of a sudden, because the flows are o are immense changes in the last couple of years, yeah. they've hardened. Their, I, their I would argue. Can I just, inter can I just I interrupt? Yeah. I think a lot of these. I mean, first of all. 1% of the world's refugees are actually resettled, 1%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 1%. So the vast majority are in the global south and they remain in the global I south in neighboring countries in refugee camps. And the problem of climate change, of, of environmental um, uh, refugees is tremendous. But in general, I think the problem of refugees is a problem of war, but ultimately it's a problem of unequal relations of power in the world. Right. This world can support its population, but it's the control over the resources is divided. I, and I, think, I, I, I don't think please, we're in a Malthusian situation. We're in a situation <laughs> where we have unequal distribution of wealth, unequal access to wealth, and I think it's a question, it's a fair question. Should we, in the most privileged nation in the world, should we share 
what we have? I think that's a deeply ethical question <laughs> that national politics finds very hard to have any kind of conversation about. Yeah. And I think, I would add that one of the trends we're seeing in response is the militarization of borders. And I think what we're finding mm -hmm. is that that is tremendously lethal. And I think that is a parallel between what's happening in the US and what's happening in mm -hmm. Europe. We've seen the Fortress Europe approach has resulted in staggering numbers of deaths in the Mediterranean of folks right. drowning and the criminalization of even those who attempt to aid them. And similarly, yeah. I would argue all the billions that you mentioned we funneled that to border security have also resulted in the essential fueling of organized crime um, on the Mexican side that has made it very, very profitable, just the way you saw in prohibition with alcohol. The same has happened with human smuggling, being converted to human trafficking, and being a very, very lucrative industry. So I think we're finding that criminalization is not an effective approach, and that redefining what constitutes a refugee to fit not just a post-World War II definition, which is really outdated, but one that will fit climate change and those other crises, I think, is crucial. And I, again, I mean, it always gets heated towards the end, which is great. <laughs> we're about to wrap. But I, I did think that, you know, what you were saying, if I may, you know, we kind of started the conversation with perceptions and why perceptions matter. And I think what you were outlining is something that is really perception driven. You know, why would you share when your perception is that things are scarce? Um, because I think that is ultimately a perception and something that we can, I mean, I don't know. I, you know the debate will continue. The debate continues separate. online. But anyway, I, I do want to <laughs> thank you all for coming. And uh, please Thanks. thank our panelists with a round of applause. Wow, what a fantastic conversation. You remember I said at the outset that we could be here all day and, you know, as we heard maybe <laughs> with the flash did. floods, we will. Uh, <laughs> but, but here are three things that I want you to keep in mind uh, as, you, as you leave today. First, you'll be able to find the video of today's conversation on University Life's YouTube, YouTube channel. We will send it to you. Please share it with others and find ways to continue the conversation around the university on this. Second, uh, if you're interested in talking more about these issues and the tremendous diversity within Columbia, I want to invite you to join this Friday's task force, first of the year meeting of the task force on inclusion and belonging at Columbia. You can find out more about that on University Life's website. Third is we really welcome your thoughts on all of these issues and please write if you'd like to share and we can share out your thoughts uh, uh, depending on what length they are, possibly on some of our social media. Uh, so you can just write to us at universitylife at columbia.edu. Actually, fourth, um, every Tuesday, every every other Tuesday, every student at Columbia will receive from University Life a newsletter that is designed to help you find out about the kinds of events and conversations on campus that you might not otherwise know about. Because students often say, "Oh, wow! I heard there was that great event last week," and this will be the thing that helps you learn about the great event ahead of time. Last and most importantly, I really want to thank you all for coming and please join me in thanking our spectacular panel for today's conversation.